from lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Well, hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and thank you for listening. Well, today is a kind of a stormy day here in Maple Grove, Minnesota. It's been raining on and off, and we're supposed to get some thunderstorms. So if that prediction holds true, we'll have to hope and cross our fingers that our gardens don't sustain too much damage with hail or high winds. But, you know, days like this are really perfect for getting to spend some time in the garden, which I know is a challenge for gardeners because we tend to want to work in the garden. When we're out there, we can't help but see a weed or see something that needs our attention. And it's tough to just put all those tasks aside and just sit and enjoy the beauty of what we're creating out there. It's also a great time to take pictures in the garden because there's something about those overcast skies that lend to some real clarity in in picture taking not to mention the ambiance because the birds are singing and then the sound effect of the rain, which is absolutely lovely. So see if you can create a link in your brain between rain and enjoyment and take a cue from the rain. When you see it start to rain outside, find your favorite spot. Mine happens to be on my front porch. Head out there with a magazine or your camera, whatever is life-giving to you and take it all in. And by the way, do any of you have a dog that's deathly afraid of thunderstorms? Because I do. Sunny is such a maniac when it starts raining outside and it gets even worse if there's thunder and lightning, which I can understand. But I'm trying to help desensitize him to even just simple rain because it gets a little aggravating when he's shaking all over and jumping on me. And so I'm really trying to do what I call rain therapy with him, where when it's raining out, we go outside and we just sit there and I try to calmly reassure him that nothing bad is going to happen. But man, I tell you, if you have any tips on how to handle thunderstorms with dogs, especially big dogs like this 90-pound lab golden that Sonny is, I'd really appreciate it. Well, in terms of the garden, I'm getting really excited because we're putting in a water feature. It's going to be a, a four or three to four fall waterfall in the Eastern Garden. And anytime you're doing a massive redo in the garden, There's all the anticipation, which is fantastic. You're dreaming of what that new space is going to look like. But at the same time, it's a lot of work. This is an area where I had a water feature installed probably seven to eight years ago, and it's since just fallen into a terrible state. And so what we're going to do is rip that whole thing out and then line nursery, a local nursery in our area is coming in and they're going to be putting in a pondless river June 9th uh, is when they're going to start. So I'm very excited for this to start. In fact, it kind of slipped my mind a little bit. I don't know what it is about the end of May, but May always ends so abruptly and my mind. It's almost like the start of May. I'm so excited about all the things that I get to start doing outside. And then we'll end up with a cold snap and then usually some rain, which which kind of puts an end to that activity. And then you look up and all of a sudden it's June 1. And for me, that means I've got a ton of birthdays to address, including my mother-in-law and my brother, uh, whose birthday is today, by the way. So happy birthday, Justin. But, you know, June just sneaks up on me. So I, I kind of forgot that this project was going to get started. And in my mind, I had more time to address some of the things that I want to save and remove because in the area that they're going to be working, it's already fully landscaped. And I have a ton of perennials in those beds and I need to get them moved because the whole thing is going to get obliterated starting June 9th. So I have about six days to send my student gardeners out there and line up pots and places for this plant material to go while the construction is happening. Now, supposedly they can put this water feature in in about three to four days. So by the middle of June, I would say by June 15th, the entire project should be done. 
But of course, best laid plans. I'll have an unveiling of what it'll look like once it's all finished and I'll put it on the blog. So if you're curious, you can come take a look. I'm sure I'll be posting lots of pictures about it. And I might even interview a couple of the guys that are working on the project and pick their brains a little bit about installing water features and things that you might want to consider if you're going to do something like that on your property. There are a couple of other minor things that are on my list for June, one of which is to have my sprinkler system guy come out midway through this project and just check to make sure that they don't hit the main line or there aren't any repairs necessary. That's something proactive you can do whenever you're scheduling a big reno project on your property. Inevitably, if you have an in-ground sprinkler system, something's going to get hit and try to get those guys to come out in the middle of a project on a last minute basis can be really tricky. So I just try to anticipate when in the project we'll probably need someone to come out and help us in the event that something bad happens. And I usually give it about a day and a half into the project. So I have Jonathan from Northwest Landscape coming out on Friday, the day after the project starts. And hopefully we won't need him, but if we do, we've got him scheduled. Now, other than that big project for June, there's just a lot of little things that need to happen in the garden this month. First of all, I'm putting in some eye hooks under the deck on the south side of the house. So our deck is south facing, but below the deck, I installed a shade garden. And it also happens to be the place where I like to put my house plants for the summer months. So I'm installing these eye hooks so that I can have some of these house plants elevated up off the ground. So like my Hoyas and my vining house plants. And then I will install drip irrigation so that they are getting regular watering. And then really it's set it and forget about it. And I really won't pay them much attention until fall when it's time to bring them back in the house, at which time I will give them a nice long bath and probably soap them up with some dish soap and then spray them with sharp streams of water to eliminate any pest issues that might accompany them on their way back into the house. June also means it's time for me to start harvesting rhubarb and keep harvesting it throughout the entire month. My rhubarb patch was installed probably about 10 years ago, and it's really maintenance-free. But I tell you what, it does you no good if you install a rhubarb patch and then forget to harvest it. So get out there, send your kids out there, somehow, some way, get that rhubarb harvested, bring it in the house. At a minimum, you can start chopping it up and put it in some freezer bags until you're ready to use it. Of course, around here, I never have any in freezer bags because the minute we get it, we start baking with it, thanks to Emma. It's something you can do if you don't have time to get baking or if you just want to have some on hand throughout the rest of the summer. June is also my month to share my garden with my friends. And by that, I mean that I'm going through my garden and I'm making a list of all of the perennial flowers that are really fast growers or that are taking over my garden. So things like Monarda or Artemisia or Iris, or sometimes things that I know I need to divide like hostas or grasses. And it's this little practice that really helps my garden design stay neat and tidy and true to plan. Well, those are just a few of the things that I hope to get done this month in June. If you want the complete list of my garden to-dos, you can head over to sixfootmama.com and see them all in their glory. Spoiler alert, they probably all won't get done, which is probably why there's that quote, gardener's dream bigger dreams than emperors. So I guess we're really good at dreaming and maybe not so great at getting through our to-do list. But we're trying at least, and we're optimistic about it. So that's all good. Well, today's guest is someone that I am so excited for you to listen to. His name is Robert Corrick, and he is the author of the book Understanding Roots, which is really the follow up to his original book on roots called Roots Demystified. Both of these books are absolutely fantastic, and I think must-haves for your garden library. And by the way, they're actually cheaper on Robert's website at robertcorick.com than they are on Amazon. So don't do what I did and rush out to Amazon to get them because you'll actually get a better deal at Ro on Robert's website. Now, imagine if you could go out into your garden and see what is going on below ground. Just even take a moment to consider the hidden world of roots that is just under your feet. Well, Robert Couric's books are shedding light on this little understood aspect of gardening. Robert's work is sure to make you a better gardener. You're about to better appreciate that when you're looking at your garden, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. 
Well, welcome, Robert Corrick. Hi, Jennifer. Hey, Robert. How are you doing? Good. I'm so excited to get the chance to interview you today. And I think the gardeners listening to this show will no doubt greatly benefit from your lifetime of experience in the fields of horticulture and ecology. In fact, over 40 years of experience, which is just incredible. And that makes your insights on gardening just that much more impactful. You know, most people struggle to write even a single book, and you've written. 15 books. And your latest book, which was released last year, is called Understanding Roots with the subtitle Discover How to Make Your Garden Flourish. And I'm putting special emphasis on the word flourish because what I found after reading the information that you've uncovered about roots, no pun intended, is that Mm -hmm. it's been a bit of a paradigm shift for me. I think I told you in the pre-interview chat that I was planting this uh, weekend over Memorial Day weekend, and it completely changed how I viewed my plants, especially those little root hairs, as I was potting up a lot of my containers over the weekend. So that's a direct benefit of reading your book, because the veil gets lifted on the behaviors and the needs of roots, and you actually understand roots on a scientific level and leave many old assumptions behind. And once you're able to meet the needs of roots, then the greater the impact you can have on the overall health and performance of our plants. And that's really what we want listeners to get out of the show today. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I hope so, because most people have planted a tree or shrub or an annual plant they say, well, why should I uh, learn anything new? That's the word that's important, flourish, make it even better. Absolutely. Now, back in 1974, you started your landscape company, and that caught my son's attention because, of course, I'm always telling my kids about the guests that I'm interviewing and, and trying to educate them along the way as well. And he's 16. He's doing the same thing. He's starting his own uh, lawn mowing business, and he's ordering business cards and T-shirts and the whole shebang. So I'm curious, is that how you got started in the industry? And if so, did you love it right away or did you grow to love it? Well, I actually cut lawns to make uh, money in high school. And so I was doing five to 10 lawns a week, half to three acres. But uh, when I moved to California, I started basically the first organic uh, landscape maintenance company that I knew of. And that was down in Marin County. And I did it because I wanted to be outdoors. And I I had gardened around my rental house doing French intensive biodynamic double digging. But the maintenance was, of course, mostly started out with lawns and shrubbery. As I got going, uh, almost no lawns whatsoever. I took care of landscapes that had deep slopes and no lawns. So I actually worked with drought-resistant plants and no lawns early on in the mid-70s. And you were committed to being organic right from the start. Yeah, well, after about the first year, including fertilizing the lawns, which in those days was very difficult. Well, you were so ahead of your time, I'm surprised you were even able to get people to get on board with it. Yeah, yeah, but uh, also there were no pellets uh, for organic fertilizers. I had to blend powders and use a distributor that could put the powders out evenly. And then people saw I got equal results, so they didn't mind. Hmm. Now, was gardening part of your childhood or was it something that you found on your own? My uh, grandparents were avid gardeners. One was extremely formal gardening and the other was completely wild and woolly. It's marvelous you got to experience two very different approaches. Yes, I had both the full range of how to take care of a garden. Now, Robert, I think I mentioned to you that I have listened to so many of your interviews, especially over this weekend. And I noticed that in some of your interviews, I've heard you use the term religion of gardening. And I think I understand what you're trying to convey when you use that term. But I want to make sure that you get a chance to touch on that briefly and really address why you think there's so much anxiety and misinformation in the everyday gardening experience for people. Okay, well, religion is something like uh, the French intensive biodynamic double diggers. Started out here in Santa Cruz in California, but there's books on the subject. And the guy, John Jevin, who promotes double digging, double digs his beds every year forever. And it's a lot of work. It takes hours and hours to double dig a bed that's four by 10 or so. If he'd gotten the bed to a certain point, he could switch to no till because the tilth is so great. But because of his religion, he he believes in double digging forever. And he doesn't like plastic, so he's completely opposed to drip irrigation. Everything is hand-watered on a daily basis. Whoa. Yeah. 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 
So, and there's other guarding techniques that are uh, religions, but the point being that they could broaden their base of information and get even better results. So they pick and choose what aspect from different approaches of guarding fits their needs. One critique I had of one of my books was, well, you don't tell me what to do. <laughs> I said, well, I give you a whole host of options of what to do, and you pick and choose yeah. from all those different examples what fits your back your soil, your plant. Well, and maybe it's the rigidity that does cause so much anxiety in gardeners. I mean, I talk to people all the time that are are either confused or they're so worried about a certain plant or a placement. It just kind of baffles me at times. Yeah, I think that the religions simplify things, but it gets to be very narrow sometimes and doesn't broaden your approach. And gardening should involve a lot of different approaches, though technique and plants and that sort of thing. Yeah, like grandma and grandpa, everything from formal to wild and woolly, right? (laughs) Yeah. Well, and the popularity of your books, I think, is a testament to how much we don't know about roots and how eager people are to learn more about them. They're fascinating. My first book, Roots to Mississippi, was really the first book for home gardeners on the topic. It came out uh, nine years ago. And how was that received by people? Fantastic. I've sold over 8,000 copies. Holy smokes. Yeah. And it showed up quite high in our good ranking in Amazon. So it was very well received. Better than anticipated, do you think? Yeah, because nobody had done it. So I had no idea how they would receive the book. So I thought it would do pretty well because of the illustrations of the root systems are so fascinating. They are fascinating. I, I know that's a great segue because in prepping for this show, I listened to the interview that you did with Margaret Roach on the Away to Garden podcast, and you shared that you really began this journey to mapping roots and to understanding their behavior when you stumbled on this book by Professor John Ernest Weaver. And I'm imagining that your reaction to his book is really much a Akin to the way people react to your books today, because what you saw in that book were drawings of his root maps and pictures of him basically excavating the roots of various plants and trees. And I would love to know, do you remember the name of that book? One that got me going was this, uh, is uh, The Root Development of veg- Vegetable Crops. And he's got a lot of books. He's done a lot of books, and many of them are focused on the prairie. Yeah. If you wanted to promote a natural approach to maintaining the prairie. And I know when I was doing research on him, all of his books now are in the public domain. So they are completely downloadable and viewable right from your computer, which is fantastic. Um, yes. What was it about those those images of the root systems that captured your attention so fully? Well, I was completely blown away because the roots were so much wider than the plant. And when you have a lettuce with a single lettuce plant and the roots are four feet wide and up to three feet deep, you have to rethink what you're doing, especially with raised beds. A foot raised bed is helpful, but if you do two feet of a raised bed, you get like 90% of the roots. I recommend two foot tall raised beds now. So the root maps have upped your recommendation to a two foot tall raised garden bed in order to better accommodate the roots. Yeah, most of the root system, yeah. Because if you're in a footbed, what ends up happening? What do you think happens that's that's maybe not optimal for the plant? Well, if you pack things together you know, in the garden or a raised bed, you have to fertilize and water more frequently because you've crammed all these roots together that are competing for the same soil. In the soil, they're competing for the same uh, water and nutrients. So if you spread things further apart... You get less competition, then they become more self-reliant. Okay. So like the double digging approach is famous for very intensive planting, but they have to water daily and add a lot of compost. Well, and double digging is one of gardening's oldest techniques. It's been around for a long time. But for those of you who don't know about it, double digging involves removing the topsoil, the depth of a spade, and then setting that soil aside, and then loosening another spade's depth worth of soil. And then when you return the topsoil, you're adding things like compost to create a really nice rooting zone for plants. Yeah, exactly. Now, I'm personally not a fan of double digging, primarily because I don't like to disrupt the soil life. And also, I don't want to activate all the weed seeds that are just hanging out in the soil. I just don't have the time or the strength to go out there and double dig my garden beds. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, I did a little research on Dr. Weaver, and I found out mm-hmm. he got his PhD at the University of Minnesota. So that goes over well with the Ebling household here since he's a fellow Golden Gopher. Go Gophers. Yep. Um, yep. But ultimately, he really spent his entire time as a professor at the University of Nebraska, and he worked there for almost 40 years. And when I was researching Dr. Weaver, I found this uh, beautiful infographic that kind of kept popping up, and it had this great quote that is attributed to him. And I wanted to get your reaction to it. He said, Nature is an open book for those who care to read. Each grass-covered hillside is a page on which is written the history of the past, conditions of the present, and the predictions of the future. What does this quote mean to you, Robert? Because like John Weaver, you've spent a lifetime in the fields of horticulture and ecology. Well, I think the important point of his quote is observation. Oh, you're so right. The more and more you observe what's going on, the better you can understand how you might approach gardening. And using natural models uh, is very helpful because it can kind of link you up with the ecology and the environment. So uh, I like the part where he talks about uh, reading nature. Yes, where he says nature is an open book for those who care to read. Yeah. 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 When you read nature, you start to reconsider how you garden, and that makes things uh, even better for the present and the future. Do you have a tip for people, something that you think they should be doing a better job of reading or observing that would be really impactful for them as they move forward? Well, frankly, a lot of it is pruning. Pruning. Wow. I didn't think you were going to say that. That's great advice, though. We can always do more pruning. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I wrote a book on pruning, but I didn't like the fact that they wanted lots of little drawings, little hash marks saying cut here, because the drawing in the book had nothing to resemble the plant in your garden. <laughs> oh, really? But for the, in the middle of the book, I taught people uh, how to figure out how to prune based on watching how the plant grows. Because every plant grows a slightly different way, and there's plants that bear on new growth and plants that flower on second-year growth, plants that flower on spurs on older growth for many years. So if you observe how the plant is making it flower and also how it's angle and that sort of thing, you can prune without needing to look at a book. The longer I garden, the more I realize that pruning is a skill that every gardener needs to have. And my favorite local gardener, a lady that I really admire, says she never goes into her garden without a pruners in her hand. (laughs) I know even as she was giving us a tour, she'd just prune a little bit and then talk a little bit and prune a little bit. Um, But her garden was immaculate. And it really is the backbone to a healthy garden, isn't it? Yes. uh Yeah. And there's no substitute for spending time in the garden, is there? Right. Exactly. You've got to you've got to pay attention to your plants. Well, I'm I was really curious. There was one thing that um, that I was listening for that I hadn't heard in a lot of the interviews that you've given. And what I'm curious about is how you were able to obtain the images for the root maps in your books, because your root maps are a lot of them are from Dr. Weaver. But then they're also from these European horticulturists that are doing similar work in root mapping in both Hungary and Germany. So how did you find these images? And then did you make contact with some of these folks that are doing this work? Well, the uh, people in Germany and Hungary were doing it long after Weaver and more contemporary. So that was helpful. Basically, there's a woman that does a lot of this work in actually it's Austria. I don't know how to pronounce her name for sure. It's Laura Chura. But I read the citations of every paper I get. And that Kachura kept showing up in citation after citation. So I spent a lot of time trying to track them down. I didn't know it was a woman. I uh, found her book. She does books with other people. In this case, the one called Wurzel Atlas, which stands for Root Atlas, was done with two other professors. And they did a massive amount of excavations of root systems and lots of what they call native plants in German forests and Austrian forests. And they have a whole book on what they call weeds. <laughs> oh, really? But, yeah, the whole, whole book on weeds and the grasses. And that's where I get my roots of California native plants because <laughs> some native plants from California ended up in Germany and became weeds. Oh, isn't that fascinating? Yeah, that's fa- yeah, whereas we have European grasses that are considerable weeds and invasive plants here in California. 
So what is one weed in one place is a native plant in another. Boy, isn't that the truth? It's the old real estate adage, location, location, location. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. But when I first heard about your book, in my mind, I was imagining the actual process of mapping a root system, specifically the process that was used by Dr. Weaver. And when I was describing it to my kids, I basically told them it's like an archaeological dig. And, exactly. you know, some of the photos that uh, you talk about of people doing this work are pretty crazy, right? Because they're in these trenches, essentially. Yeah, uh, one of the photos in my book shows him literally in the trench. <laughs> He's in the <laughs> trench two to four feet below the surface with no wood propping up the sides of the trench. And I like to say that he never knew what OSHA was. <laughs> well, he could have been but, dug- digging his own grave, literally. Yeah, exactly. But he, it's called the skeletal method. And it was used also in Russia to get the root systems that I have on fruit trees in the first book. Well, and just to clarify, your first book is called Roots Demystified. And then the second book, this latest book, is called Understanding Roots. Yeah, exactly. Now, it doesn't say anything anywhere in Dr. Reaver's work about how long it would take him and his staff to excavate a ginormous tree root, but it had to take a considerable amount of time. Yeah, a week, I would think. And uh, also, he never, I never could find out if he was married. I thought, boy, this guy is so particular detail. I don't know if he'd be uh, the kind of person you could live with. <laughs> yeah, he actually was married. Oh, okay. That's he was enough. married. I actually found him on Ancestry.com because I have a membership there. I love to research my own family history. And so whenever I'm researching someone like John Weaver that I don't have a lot of biographical data on, I'll generally do a search for them on Ancestry. But anyway, the curious thing I found out about him is he married a woman named Martha Helen Hasse. And, you know, here's John John Weaver, he's only the father of prairie ecology, studying prairie grass, and his wife's last name is German and Dutch, but it derives its origin from the English word has, which, wait for it, means coarse grass. (laughs) So I think it was actually meant to be that they found each other, kind of a crazy coincidence here. Right, exactly. But um, he married, and he actually had two kids, and he had a son, and the son ended up settling in California, I think about a half hour from where you're at. Oh, fantastic. Believe it or not. So switching gears a bit, I came across an article in the Journal of Experimental Botany, which I assure you I don't regularly read. But when I was, <laughs> <laughs> when I was looking at information for the show, this journal article came up from May 2003, and it was looking at the root systems of large trees in the Czech Republic. I sent the photos here. They're in this interview packet. But it Mm -hmm. was addressing one of the thoughts that I had, uh, which when I was listening to your interviews, I kept thinking, gosh, for all the technology that we have in this world, you'd think we could just image what roots look like underground using some type of ultrasound or something. Apparently, that's possible, right? Have you seen any type of image like that? Yeah, they have different uh, sort of like radar, so to speak, underground radar. Okay. What happens, all you get is a cross-section of the soil with little black dots showing where the roots are relative to the surface. You don't get the fine roots and you don't, and they never have the look from the top down. In the modern way, you do the air spade, which is a very powerful air blower that literally just dissipates all the soil uh, wherever you blow. So you can get the root system going out uh, from its circumference. Whereas the people in Austria, they in one of the books, they have a picture of all these people on their knees excavating the root system on the surface to see how wide it goes. And there's one guy standing over on the side with his arms crossed. And I think that's probably the professor. <laughs> and he had all the students doing the work, but they didn't have air spades in those days, see. <laughs> yeah, they would have killed for an air spade because air spades are apparently ideal for this kind of work because they're so gentle on roots. In fact, it's kind of interesting how they work because they operate by velocity. Yeah. 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 And when the airstream touches a smooth object, like a stone or a root, it just slips right over and nothing happens to them. So they don't damage roots at all. Yeah. But when it hits any tiny pore, 
air is compressed into it and then the pore explodes, which is why it's such a great way to excavate roots. So I can believe that the students would have thrown down their shovels and brushes if they'd have known how easy that job could have been with the help of an air spade. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) Well, that's why we've got students. So that's fantastic. So he had them uh, digging up this root system, and that was their job that year then while they were research assistants for him. They probably told their spouses at some point, I'm never digging up another tree, never planting a tree ever again. Oh, right. that's fantastic. Well, let's dive a little bit uh, deeper into root mapping because I think the finished product, the root map, is so mesmerizing. And as I was looking through them, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, these would make fabulous prints or tapestries for people to hang in their homes because they're so decorative. What are some of your favorite root maps? Well, I like the trees in general that they look looking down because they're like mandalas. Uh, everything radiates, radiates out a wonderful pattern. But my favorite is the Hungarian book on fruit trees because I'm, I spend a lot of time working with fruit trees uh, compared to ornamentals. And the guy was a total fanatic about it. He'll say like in the top two feet are 80 point. Zero two percent of the root system. <laughs> to be precise, <laughs> how he got the point zero two, I have no idea. <laughs> but the guy was uh, more fanatic than anybody else. But wow. he has a lot of different from uh, standard size fruit trees to fruit trees on dwarf rootstocks, and so you can see that even on dwarf rootstock, you have the same ratio where the roots are up to three times wider than the canopy, the drip line. Well, this, in my opinion, is one of the most powerful things we can take away from your material, which is this whole concept that roots extend well past the canopy or drip line of a tree, which is really defined the assumptions that so many of us have held on to with regard to tree roots. And what we're learning now, thanks to you, is that these roots are extending sometimes 2x or even 3x past the point where we thought they had stopped. So I think it's pretty incredible. And now, what you just said is that they it not only applies to standard trees, but also to dwarf trees as well, which is just absolutely incredible. Yeah, exactly. Well, in terms of root maps, let's see here. I was going to tell you which one was my favorite. Yeah, I liked the, um, was it the carrot? Uh, yeah. It said the yeah. root system on a carrot goes down or can go down seven feet. Yeah. And uh, the one I like is... Uh, uh, horseradish, it violates, so to speak, all the ratios and rules I have in my book. But Weaver excavated it down to uh, 14 feet. Oh, my gosh. Um, but the plant's only two to four feet high. So I use it as an example in my slideshows to say, look, there's nothing above ground that indicates anything about what the root system likes under underground. Well, isn't that the truth? You really can't look at a plant and think that you know what that root system is doing underground. In fact, I would say most of us are underestimating the amount of root structure down there. Yeah. 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 So it's probably better for us to start thinking about our plants in terms of icebergs because the part that we're seeing is just a small fraction of the plant as a whole. Yeah. 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 And roots are so important to the plant, it's not like we can be carrying on like they don't matter. Yeah, exactly. And so you need the root maps to get a a sense of where you might be going with your care. When I looked at the root maps, I was struck by how horizontal they are, Um, Yeah, the majority of the roots. Yeah, like with trees, less than 2% of all the trees have a tap root. And people visualize, and poets in particular visualize uh, tap roots anchoring the tree against tremendous winds and tough times. Yep. All that. And uh, in reality, it's the width of the root system acting sort of like a tripod uh, to give uh, a wide expanse that helps uh, anchor the tree uh, against wind. We had a white oak that died in our front yard. And here in Minnesota, it's where the, the soil is terrible. It's all clay soil. And in these uh, developments in the suburbs, it's all backfill material for the lawns and whatnot. Well, we planted this white oak and it it died. Uh, but I went to um, cut it down. I was going to dig it up. And this was just a few summers ago. And there were so many lateral roots. I thought, yep, there you go. Um 
this tree was miserable here. Uh, and now, after reading your book and understanding better about how roots operate, especially in clay soils, there was nothing wrong with that tree. It was doing what it was supposed to do. It was it was staying in those in that top area of the soil, which is where it wants to be, especially in clay soil, right? Exactly. Uh, the clay soil, clay soil draws the uh, roots up, so to speak, uh, forces them up near the surface. So one of the guidelines in my book is uh, in a heavy soil, the roots are half again as wide as the foliage. Sandy soil alone, it might be up to three times wider. But if there's a uh, hard pan or a heavy clay, it'll force the roots even higher, and so they might go five times wider. In the foliage because they need to get a certain volume of soil to be happy. Yeah. Um, there's another drawing in my book that shows how you base the uh, volume of soil that a root system needs on what the diameter is of the mature tree. And then you follow over on the grid, it drops down, you say, oh, it might need a uh, thousand cubic feet of soil to be happy. So that's where you can figure out how much soil volume you need next to a patio or sidewalk, that sort of thing. You know, that brings up an interesting point, too, because, you know, if most people are thinking that trees are primarily tap roots, like that's the most important root, that's really underestimating the role that these other types of roots are playing, such as, you know, the lateral roots or the sinker roots or the root hairs. They're all extremely important, right, to a tree. Yes. Yes. In fact, uh, oh, the top 12 to 18 inches might be well over 50 percent of all the roots of a tree. Yeah, think about that. We don't think about that. Yes, yes. And so the the impact on that is you you don't need to buy the so-called root feeders that are tubes that are two feet long because you're forcing a whole lot of water below the root system. Yes. (laughs) And you're you're clogging the pore space with water and uh, it can't take the volume that you're putting there so it erodes, makes holes in the soil underneath. Uh, And it's below the root system. That's why rain and the drip system are the best ways uh, to irrigate trees. This is a great example of science disproving a lot of the widely held practices that people have in place when it comes to how to take care of tree roots. So in this instance, just from your material, we're learning that watering a tree at the base of the tree right up next to the trunk is out and Forcing water way below the root zone is out, completely unnecessary and ineffective, and saturating the soil, also detrimental to trees. There are so many of these things that people are doing with great intention. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But what we're learning from the science is that we've really got to change some of our practices here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that means we have a lot of learning to do. Exactly. Well, I know last summer, the U.S. Botanic Garden had this awesome exhibit that was called The Secret Life of Roots that initially I don't think people were too excited about. But once they went and they saw this exhibit, they got to see uh, the work of this ecologist named Dr. Jerry Glover, and he was showing these prairie grasses from shoot to root. So basically, he he had the prairie grass, but then he had the root system kind of hanging down below that, sometimes 10 to 15 feet long, which really surprised people. And I think it was that wow factor that really left an impression on people because when they see those remarkable root systems, it starts to give them an idea of how hard plants have to work to survive. And And I would say how much they have to suffer as well, because we basically create hostile work environments for our plants, especially the roots. And I'm curious to know from your perspective, what are some of the things that people are doing with good intentions that have really terrible ramifications for root health? Well, a lot of people have rototillers or use rototillers, especially for vegetable gardens. And when you're growing a vegetable garden, if you have trees in your yard, the chances are the roots are near the a vegetable garden or in the vegetable garden. So rototilling destroys a massive amount of the feeder roots. Um, so by switching over time to more of a no-till or heavy mulch system, you can protect the roots of the trees and still get adequate or better 
yields for vegetables. In a clay soil like you have, it takes a while. You need to, you may even uh, speed the process up by double digging for a number of years. But after a certain period of time, you can increase the tilth enough that you don't have to do much in the way of cultivation to plant. Well, I have no doubt in my mind that Dr. Weaver would have also been in favor of no-till. And that's a perfect segue into this quote that I found at the beginning of one of his books. And here's what he wrote. He said, The student of plant production should have a vivid mental picture of the plant as a whole. It is just as much of a biological unit as is an animal. The animal is visible as an entity and behaves as one. If any part is injured, reactions and disturbance of the whole organism are expected. But in the plant, our mental conception is blurred by the fact that one of the most important structures is underground. So now, Robert, given all of the work that you've done in this subject area, if you were to write a children's book about roots, what types of information would you want to include to grow adults that in future generations would have a better understanding of plants, roots to shoots? Well, I think we'd have a couple of worms talking to each other, exploring the soil, and uh, they would just start crawling around down deep and say, hey, there's nothing down here. Uh, let's go closer up to the top, and as they got closer to the surface, they'd find more root hairs, a healthy environment for them as well as the roots. Oh, I uh, love so that I idea. Could, yeah, I think maybe you gave me an idea. I make more money at children's books. And <laughs> <laughs> you never know, but really it's, it's like um, even it's something as simple as how our limited understanding of roots gets established really early on. I know with my my own kids, they're doing plant biology. They start doing that in fourth grade. And even just asking them basic questions about, well, what do you think about roots? And and everybody's imagining a taproot, basically, when you talk about a root. They're not thinking about root hairs. They're not thinking about lateral. They're thinking about vertical roots going straight down into the ground. I just am, I'd love to pick your brain a little bit on root hairs and the importance of root hairs because I think as gardeners, you know, when we're doing container gardening or any type of uh, planting, uh, it's real easy to pop those things off or you know take off the bottom half of the pot because you don't want to dig so deep or or you know minimize maybe the impact that you're having on the plant by snapping some of those off. But how how detrimental is that to a plant? Well, I think that it's not as detrimental as people might think in that roots do have a lot of resilience. I mean, they're, they're very tough in a way they can adapt. Um, if the plant is pot bound, I tend to tear off a lot of the roots at the bottom so that they don't circle in the planting area. Um, and if you do it correctly and water uh, correctly, then you're less likely to have the plant go into wilt. Uh, but when you tear off the bottom half, uh, let's say, the remaining roots tend to form laterals. And it's the laterals that start to have the root hairs on them. And root hairs are just one cell, uh, and they last about one day. Um, so it's very important to provide an optimal environment to keep the root hairs happy. And on root hairs tend to farm on new growth. So the wide diameter of root system, three times wider than the foliage, means that a big proportion of the feeding roots, the root hairs, are out beyond the drip line um, so that you need to provide a a healthy environment to keep them happy. Yeah, see, that's the kind of thing that people don't appreciate. Yeah, and there's a, uh, out here we have revegetation nurseries that grow crops, so to speak, for revegetation, native plants primarily, and they grow most of the plants in tubes that are 6 to 12 inches deep and 1 to 2 inches in diameter. It has a hole at the bottom, so the roots get air pruned, and the effect is the same. When the root hair gets down to the hole, it dies and causes a lot of lateral growth in the tube, so that when you go out to plant the uh, plant, usually trees, in the environment, there's a lot more lateral roots to make uh, it happier for the transplanting transition. Well, that's a great idea. I wish it was more widely done. Yeah, I, I would prefer that there be tube-grown plants in regular nurseries, but it still isn't happening. I talk about it almost every lecture I give to give people an idea that 
if you start with a smaller plant, you can grow trees that are so sturdy that you don't ever need to stake them or tie them because they flex in the wind and they develop a better diameter and a stronger trunk. But it works better to start with a small plant than trying to take a plant that's overgrown in a container and is too tall for its root system. And then you have to stake it or, or uh, tie it up or what have you. Yep, very true. In fact, I apply the same strategy when I'm buying perennials. So if I'm looking at a row of perennials or a bed of perennials that are uh, set up in an area, I'll always go for the perennial that looks more compact or newer growth because I'd rather see that growth in place in my own garden instead of buying something overgrown and then transplanting it. Yeah, in our area, uh, there's finally a tremendous availability of four-inch pots. So I usually buy only four-inch pots. If the root system isn't too overgrown in a four-inch pot, uh, it'll be as big or bigger than a one-gallon plant inside of one to two years. You know, uh, even as you were saying that, I was thinking about um, the big box stores uh, here in the Midwest, because even just stopping by Lowe's or Home Depot, um, those pots are gallon pots in most of the yep. in most of the shelf space. You know, a lot of times people are looking to accelerate that whole sleep, creep, leap continuum for plants. And they think that if they buy a plant that's in a gallon pot, that they can accelerate that trip to maturity a lot quicker. But that's not always the case because sometimes the plant that's in a gallon pot is actually a four inch plant, not a gallon plant. Yeah. So you've got to be real careful when you're buying plants in gallon pots or any container for that matter and do your due diligence. And I'm sure the nurseries and the garden centers are eager to take advantage of people's desire for bigger plants. It's pretty incredible. It must be what they think customers want, or it must be what customers think they want, uh, because they don't know any different. That's part of it, but they make more money. <laughs> and, they, and they make more uh, money, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Four, yeah. Our four-inch pots, I know they run about 3 to $5, and uh, one gallon are more like 12 to 18 That's right. Yep, that's right. Well, um, let's play a little game. I'm going to call it Game of Roots <laughs> instead of Game of Thrones. We'll call it Game of Roots. But we're going to go through um, some of the common myths about roots and have you debunk them. So heads up to the listeners. These are all myths. None of these are true statements. But I'm going to say uh, the myth, and then I'll have Robert tell us why it's a myth. Okay, the first one, tree roots extend to the canopy of the tree. And this is the idea that the way a tree looks above ground is a mirror image of the way a tree must look below ground. And a lot of people think this. Yeah, like if they have a rounded top tree, they think the root system is deep and rounded below ground, a total mirror, whereas in every case it's completely different. The root system is shallow in the sense that it's in the top 12, 18 inches which is shallow compared to what a lot of people think. Oh, my gosh, um, absolutely. Yeah, and it's much wider. So the big myth about that is, well, you don't need to put as much water, nutrients, compost, mulch uh, out to the drip line. You should be saving it to go near the drip line and beyond, like a donut of mulch beyond the drip line. And nobody's thinking that, are they? No, they're not. It takes a lot of mulch, but if you have, a uh, limited supply of mulch, you don't mulch six, eight feet out from a trunk on a tree that's 10 feet wide. You save the mulch and start out at six, eight feet and go beyond the drip line and you'll have a happier tree. Yes, so we need to move from volcanoes to donuts of mulch for happy trees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Now, here's one uh, that I, I would love to get your <laughs> feedback on, and that is when construction sites have big old trees, and, and, and this doesn't always happen where they actually get saved because a lot of times they're just going to demolish them. But uh, this myth is that construction sites can protect trees with snow fencing or basically just putting a perimeter fence uh, maybe 10 feet out from the trunk of the tree and think that they're saving the life of that giant oak or or whatever kind of tree it is. Right. In the old days around here, the construction machinery sometimes hit the trunk and damage it. So they first put the, that we use these orange types of fencing about four feet high and we, they put it out three, four feet to protect the trunk. And now we see most of the trees have a drip line fencing 
Uh, but it's fascinating that you've protected the area from the trunk up to the drip line, but there's more feeding roots beyond the drip line. <laughs> so the area they have let the machinery work in is getting compacted and damaging more of the healthy uh, or helpful roots than the inside of the uh, fencing. Is it kind of like cutting the mouth off of the tree in a sense, if that's, well, that's where most of, of the feeder it. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I was I'll thinking, well, there you go. <laughs> well, I was I was trying to explain it to my kids because I was saying, listen, I'm listening to this guy named Robert. And I said, you know how grandma and grandpa are always taking the hose and they're putting it right next to the, the base, the trunk of the tree when they get a new plant. I said, you know, after listening to Robert, they should probably pull that hose out a little bit and have it, you know, do a slow drip you know, further out, further away from the plants to encourage that, or from the base of the plant to encourage that root growth. And yeah, um, and I said, it'd be the equivalent of me trying to feed you through your belly button. And they were all like, oh, ha, ha, ha. But they got it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way of looking at it. Well, the uh, uh, usually on a brand new planting, I try to put the emitters uh, at the interface between where the planting area was and the untouched native soil. Because the wet spot, go wider below ground and water both a little bit away from the, the base of the plant and out into the native soil. And that would lure the roots out of the planting area. And they really don't want to be there, right? That's not where they want to stay anyway, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of people put a tremendous amount of compost in their planting hole and fertilizer and all kinds of amendments and they think they're doing great things for the trees. Well, the tree is going to have to, at some point, get used to the native soil. I mean, uh, eventually it will try to get out of the planting hole. Um, if it, if there's such a difference between the composted soil and the planting hole edge, the roots just start to circle, and they're less likely to try to leave the planting area. Plus, they're feeding on all the high-level nutrients. So my pro- approach is to use native soil in the planting area so there's no transition between the planting area and the native soil, and the roots can grow faster sideways and get beyond the planting area. And then uh, the tree has to evolve to deal with the uh, soil it has. Why not start that way? Yeah, and that makes so much more sense. But you have to choose the right tree for the situation. Like, I don't know your species of oak, but uh, some of our oaks in California can't handle the clay because it's too much moisture near the base of the root system, crown of the root system. Okay. The third myth would be roots flare out in perfect symmetry from trees or plants, like rays of the sun. Well, sometimes that's true. But if it's, if there's any variability in the soil, they're going to adapt to the soil. Um, so I have a root drawing in my Understanding Roots book that shows a pine tree on a lump on a slope, and it hit lousy rocky soil at first and there are very few roots and they're they're large uh, tough roots and they get out of that fractured hard rock into a more decent soil and they just bloom so to speak they just go wide and deep and multiply like crazy and they have a lot of smaller roots which gives you more surface area so to speak for root hair so it really adapts to what the soil is like Hmm, That's extraordinary. So changes in the soil will definitely impact where the roots prefer to go. Exactly. And if you want to try to get down to figuring that out, we have what we call soil probe. It's a tube up to about 24 inches, 18 to 24 inches long with a handle on top. And it has an open slit down one side of it. So you screw it into the ground and pull it out and you can see the soil and you can see where it's darker at the top and gets a little bit less, more gray, and then it gets orange for clay. And you know then that in the clay soil, the roots are less likely to explore. So you know that most of the root systems are above that clay, and that means that gives you an idea of how long to water. Yeah, because you don't need to water for hours if the roots are hanging out in the top foot of the soil. Exactly. And like here... At my house in Occidental, the soil, native uh, soil, has only good soil in the top 6 to 12 inches. So the root system has to grow really wide, and I don't have to water very deep, but I have to mulch wider. So really, we're spending a lot of time meeting needs that the root systems don't actually have, and we're 
not spending any time (laughs) trying to meet needs that they actually do have because we don't understand how they work. You're right. That's crazy. (laughs) Here's another question, or here's another myth that I think people don't appreciate the impact of, and it has to do with compaction. And the myth is that compaction doesn't really affect roots, that they're tougher than we give them credit for, and we can just disregard compaction as an issue for roots. Well, the compaction is uh, causes a lot of destruction to the pore space, so the little tiny pores in the soil that allow gases to come out. I call them farts, the, the <laughs> toxic gases that soil life makes, and then receive the oxygen and nitrogen back down into the soil. Uh, those gases, uh, the pore space is totally important to help the roots be happy and get the oxygen that they require and in the case of nitrogen fixing plants, the uh, nitrogen gas. And so the compaction destroys the pore structure and that's the beginning. And then it also can physically destroy the roots themselves by crushing them or breaking them. Compaction means that permanent pathways are very important. So you, you get compaction from the limited area of the pathway and you're not just always walking all over the root system. Yeah. Here's another myth. Uh, The size of the tree or plant indicates the size of the root system. You really can't tell by looking at a tree or a plant what the root system is going to look like underneath. Yeah. In the case of plants in general, it's usually wider than the foliage, but sometimes deeper than people imagine. I like to use the example of excavation of a horseradish that Weaver did. And it went down, I think it was 14 feet deep. But the foliage is two to four feet high above the ground so that looking at the plant above ground tells you absolutely nothing about what the root system might be uh, below ground. You need to read my books to find that out. Mm -hmm. There you go. Now, all trees have tap roots. Uh, This is another myth. Um, And if they snap off, they can regenerate. Less than 2% of all the trees have a tap root. And... They especially don't have a taproot if there's subsoil near the surface. And when you plant a tree, you destroy the taproot if it has one at all um, in the process of transplanting uh, or it was destroyed when they dug it up and put it in the bald uh, burlap sack. And they don't really regrow the taproot. They might grow some more vigorous roots, but they tend to be more horizontal and less vertical. And this is where, if if the tree doesn't have tap roots, this is where those sinker roots that are coming down from the lateral roots are really important because they're they're doing the job of anchoring the tree, right? Right. Those are especially important in fruit trees. A lot of the native trees and oaks and have less likely to get sinker roots at different intervals out from the trunk. Uh, apples do have lots of sinker roots. But I have one drawing in the book of a pine tree that has dozens of sinker roots going out the whole distance uh, of the root system. Here's the last myth. It says, tap roots are genetically designed to extend down to a set depth based on the species of tree in order to anchor the tree, no matter the type of soil condition. So this myth is really saying that the type of tree... Um, and the type of soil will indicate how how far down the tap root would go. Well, there, it, you might be able to make the case for the genetics uh, help you understand how wide the root system is going to get. Uh, like in the case of a lettuce, uh, three four feet wide um, and two to four feet deep. But it depends upon the soil. So I think Weaver had ideal soil because his root systems are so. Uh, symmetrical and deep, whereas, again, in my place in Occidental, the, the clay soil is just 18 inches down, so the roots hit that and primarily go sideways rather than sending any tap root or any lateral roots further down into the soil. So they adapt to what's there, uh, and, again, that means uh, the water has to be further from the trunk because the root system is wider. Yeah. 
Uh, before I forget to ask, can you share a little bit about the aerobic layers of soil? Because you say that soil is built from the top down and that it all begins with duff or litter on the forest floor. And you actually have a really great graphic, a kind of a cartoon that shows how the more aerobic soil impacts plant growth and health. So what is aerobic soil for people who are who have no idea? And where is it and how can people build more of it? So aerobic soil is that soil that exchanges the waste fumes, so to speak, and allows the oxygen and the nitrogen and other gases to permeate into the soil. Um, that feeds a whole range of bacteria, good, good bacteria, algae, good fungi, um, actinomycetes, uh, nitrogen-fixing nodules. keeps a whole lot of soil life happy. So like in one of the drawings, I think the top... Uh, Three inches of the soil has five units of uh, beneficial algae, blue-green algae. You can go down another three inches, and you have only five units. So you lose one, you lose, only have one fifth the amount of good stuff. Uh, three, four, five, six inches down. So the top three inches is the most aerobic, where the deeper you go, the less oxygen you have, and becomes what's called anaerobic lacking oxygen. Sounds like uh, something else you could have those worms talking about in that children's book. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'm going to take <laughs> notes on this kid's book. <laughs> I love that idea because I really think we've got to start getting them young. we got to train them. we got to get them going the right direction. So, Exactly. Um, okay, you know, I know that uh, you are, uh, you have this lifetime of experience, but you're also so uh, pragmatic and informative when it comes to planting trees. And there is so much misinformation uh, about planting trees, and apparently people cannot get it figured out. So why is it so dang hard to get the word out about how to properly plant a tree, and what is the Robert Corrick uh, advised way to just simply plant a tree? Okay, the model I use is Dr. Shigo's approach to we don't prune flush to the trunk. We prune at an angle, slight angle, based on the, the ridge graft, the... Uh, on a tree, and it took them, you know, 20, 30, 40 years now to where people are starting to understand to do that. But they learned the wrong way a lot from nurseries. I mean, one of the biggest problems we have is uninformed nursery staff. So, like, when I talk about mulching beyond the drip line, uh, it's just starting to show up with master gardeners around the country but not still in the nursery. So we have a tremendous amount of uh, education to do to help out the trade. Even. So anyway, the way I plant is I don't do a planting hole. I call it a planting area, which I mentioned a lot of times before. Uh, I tend to keep as much of the root system above the existing grade into a planting mound for a number of reasons. One, we use a lot of native and Mediterranean plants in California and they hate water near the base of the plant. It can cause uh, root rot mm -hmm. very easily, especially in late spring rains. Um, so the mound is also is meant to uh, drain the soil so we don't get root rot. But also, it serves a way of forcing the roots away from the planting area. In other words, most of the planting area is above grade, and where it meets the interface with the existing soil is about the same level. Um, but you mulch and irrigate at the interface between the planting area and the untouched native soil. And that means that in the summertime, there's no water at all in the top 10, 12 inches of soil, let's say. But there's water two, three, four feet away from the trunk, keeping the new roots happy and encouraging them to grow away from the tree. Um, so I use only native soil. Uh, I don't use any amendments whatsoever in the planting area because it would force the roots to localize. They're going to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner if you serve it all in one place. They're not going to say, okay, let's try to go up against this nasty soil. Let's just, they'll say, let's just stay here and eat the good stuff yep. uh, or the loose stuff or the compost stuff. So the kids' book would have to have worms uh, realizing that uh, they can't get out of the planting hole. But um, I also use native soil because, you know, if the root system is going to get five times wider than the foliage, 
it better get adapted as soon as possible to the soil. Uh, you pick the right rootstock for the soil, and it'll be happy and be able to grow beyond the planting area. That means in our clay soils, uh, you can't grow peaches. You can grow plums and apples uh, or walnuts in particular. They're very good with heavy soils. But uh, peach trees and nectarines just hate it. So that means you either do a raised bed as big as possible or you skip growing peaches. Cheaper to buy them at the farmer's market anyway. Sure. Well, there you go. That's right. Well, yeah, you do have to be a little bit planful about picking the right material to put in your landscape. Yeah, I don't know what oak you had, but we have oaks that, uh, species of oaks that take standing water for weeks on end in the flatlands near riparian habitats. But we have others that if you did that, they would die immediately. So that the native oaks that grow near the coast and up on the slopes, they can't tolerate standing water whatsoever. So you really have to know what the species is to pick the right oak. Speaking of uh, questions about trees, I have a few listener questions for you. The first is uh, from a woman who said she has a tree in her front yard with so many roots that are heaving at the surface of her lawn that she's hitting them with her lawnmower, even tripping over them at times. And her question is, can she remove these roots? And if so, how should she do it? No. The more you damage the root system, the more you run the risk of uh, actually killing the, the plant or the tree. Basically, you have to learn what trees can tolerate lawns and what trees do not like to grow in lawns. So that list is in my first book, Roots Demystify. There's one chapter on plants that like lawns, and there's another one on plants, trees rather, that heave surfaces like patios. Yep. The other way to go is to not have a lawn and mulch it. Uh, basically, when you're watering a lawn, you've taken away the mulch, the duff that a forest would naturally have, and you're irrigating the root system without having the mulch to protect it. So you really can do a lot of damage by messing with the roots near the surface. Another way is to not water as often and try to get a little bit more depth to the root system. But the basic uh, guideline is you got to get the right root system to uh, adapt. So a lot of the roots that pop up near the surface where you water the lawn came originally from riparian habitats. This is my theory. I can't find a whole lot of science to back it up yet. But we have native uh, sycamores that grow in the riparian habitats of creeks in California. And you stick those in lawns and the roots come up, boom, right to the top and go out for hundreds of feet sometimes. Wow. <laughs> Seems like hundreds of feet, but they go out very wide. And so the exposed root system, I've seen exposed root systems on lawns with sycamores 10, 12 feet away from the trunk. Hmm, stunning. Now, here's a follow-up question to that. Uh, and another listener had this question, which is, can I bury surfacing roots? So, in other words, rip out the grass and just put soil down enough to cover uh, that root system that's coming up to the surface. Well, if you keep it to a few inches, I don't think it's going to hurt. But uh, if you're taking an existing tree around a house and, and construction soil is bearing a foot of it, you got a real problem. The first thing you do is build the tang wall around the area near the trunk as far away from the trunk as possible. So, in other words, if you have the room, put a retaining wall four or five, six feet away from the trunk. Uh, but you still have a problem with that new soil on top of the old is going to still block the aerobic exchange of gases so that the pore structure is going to be uh, destroyed where the new soil is added on top of the existing soil. Okay. Uh, so you're really not supposed to bury uh, existing roots. Okay. But mulching is preferable. But mulching has a lot of exchange of gases. It doesn't have, it's much more aerobic than soil. So it can keep the soil happier. Now, uh, here was another question. Do tree roots grow after the tree is cut down? So you chop down a tree. People sometimes think the roots are st still growing. Are they still growing? Well, if you chop down a tree, I think they might still grow depending on the plant because some trees send up what we call suckers. And so the root system's still alive and, and growing like crazy. But because there's less volume of wood, so to speak, uh, for the nutrients, 
to pump back up, they make a lot of suckers to compensate or try to compensate. But yeah, they continue to grow when you cut down. But when we cut down a native dug fir, it's dead. It does not send up suckers. Here's another question that was about removing roots. So sometimes when people are in their gardens, they're removing shrubs, they're removing trees. And the question always comes up, should I remove those roots? This particular question is asking, should I visit a garden center to buy chemicals that speed up the decomposition of roots? And then do they even need to remove the roots after they have dug up old plant material? You know, it's a complex series of questions. Basically, if the root mass is very, very dense, usually like where a lawn used to be, you will do damage to the uh, root system of the tree when you plant a shrub. So reduce that as much as possible, but don't buy anything to decompose the roots because it usually is too caustic, if not toxic. So what I did in one job recently is the mass of roots was phenomenal because the lawn had been watered very shallow for many years. So I didn't want to do a lot of damage to the root system, but it was just totally sick. So what I did is I picked a plant that natural growth would go 6, 8, uh, 12 feet wide. So I only had to plant a limited number of shrubs. That means if I wanted to plant in one area and I hit a whole lot of roots, I could try moving the planting area or hole a foot or two away and see if I had less roots. Moving the plant one or two feet in all directions is not going to be a big impact because the root system can grow 8, 10, 12 feet wide. So that's an important guideline is not to plant something that gets only two feet wide if you got to have a whole lot of planting areas. Here's another question which has to do with leaning ornamental trees. Here in the Midwest, people like to buy a lilac tree or a hydrangea tree, and uh, that's how we get the ornamental color, you know, in the spring or in the fall. And Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times these trees, you know, they get planted. That's fantastic. But then they start to lean a little bit just for various reasons. They'll start to tip. And uh, this question is saying that they want to straighten the tree, but they don't want to hurt the tree. And so the suggestion they had is they were going to dig on one side and then kind of prop the tree up and then pull them straight and then pack in more soil so that they're straight again. What What's the best oh, oh. way to help a tree stand <laughs> up straight? Well, first off, does it need to stand up straight? Sometimes trees can lean at a certain angle. If it's not too far, they'll still be happy. Uh, that still grow. Uh, I don't plant very many plants at an angle, but I don't mind them going to an angle uh, up to a certain point because the forest doesn't always have completely straight trees. Um, But if you want to have a straight tree, you need to stake it, but not staking it where you tie the stake to the trunk. You You put three stakes out a foot or so beyond the trunk and use figure eight uh, rubber tubing or gasket, so to speak. And so that you want the tree or shrub to move as much as possible. So you use the, the ties to help straighten it up, and then you allow it to blow some in the wind um, so it'll develop a stronger trunk. And after a number of years, which might take a decade, the wood will be stiff enough Uh, And strong enough, you can take those stakes away and it'll stand up. Okay. Better than digging in and trying to straighten it that way. Oh, yeah. 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 A lot of trauma for the tree. Well, I tell you what, you're a lavender expert in addition to understanding roots and uh, drip irrigation and all the other things that you've written about. And I did have one question about lavender from a listener in Dallas, Texas. And she said... I've always had a hard time keeping lavender alive for more than a year, either in the pot or in the ground. And so she was giving it another go, and she was wondering if you had any suggestions for keeping them alive. Well, lavender loves good drainage. Uh, English lavender actually comes from the Alps north of France and Italy, and it grows in rocky soil that's like uh, three-quarters or more rock and less soil. It's essential to have good drainage. So sometimes when people plant in the ground, they've got too much clay, and that's where a planting mound would be very helpful to try to get that soil to drain away from the base of the plant. It's less likely that the soil would be too heavy in a planting pot, 
But places like Seattle, I, I went to school at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and it has a lot of humidity. And lavender plants can get diseases from too much humidity. Hmm. Uh, so like out here in California, the lavender, we have lavender fields that are 1 to 10 acres, let's say, and they do fine because the summers are so dry. So I think it's a real difficult situation. So what people do outside of California and humid areas is plant uh, lavender in a container and put it up against the south or west wall of the house under the eave. And then the heat helps dissipate some of the humidity and gives it the kind of uh, environment it needs. Lavender can take phenomenal amount of heat, in part because they grow in all that gravel where they are native. It's a matter of getting as much heat to try to deal with the moisture, watering as little as possible, and keeping the drainage as as good as possible. Hmm. I don't think anybody's ever mentioned the humidity before, which, of course, we have very little control over. So creating that little microclimate against the house is probably the only answer. And other than that, we probably love them to death, right? We're watering them or we're babying them with really nice soil, and they don't need it. Yeah, like a lavender is like rosemary. It tends to, well, rosemary tends to get these uh, yellow branches that start to show up and people water them and you go, oh my God, it's dying. Well, the yellow branches on rosemary is phytophthora, the root rot. Uh, so they water more and they increase the root rot and kill the plant. Hmm. In lavender, it's a kind of a gray brown. Uh, the foliage dies into a gray brown color. And they say, oh, my God, there's a hole here. I mean, there's a brown area here. I'll water it some more. Oh, wow. And the next thing you know, the plant's dead. So overwatering is probably the most likely way to kill a lavender. Wow. Well, in addition to being called a permaculture pioneer, you've also been coined a gray water guru. And I know I talked to you right before the show and I said, listen, you know, up here in the Midwest, we're not experiencing drought, certainly not to the extent that you have in California. But I tell people, hey, drought comes to everybody's door sooner or later. So for the folks who haven't had to deal with drought, they're probably blissfully ignorant of this term gray water. But I'm wondering if you could chat with us briefly about uh, gray water, what it is compared to brackish water or fresh water, and then how do you collect it and why do roots love it? Okay. Houses generate two types of water, what they call black water, which is all the sewage from the toilet. And then gray water, which is the relatively cleaner water, especially from the showers and bathtubs and bathroom sinks. Kitchen sink has gray water, but it's got so much particulates, it can clog everything. So we don't use the water from a kitchen sink or dishwasher. Uh, but um, we use it from a laundry and from a shower and from a bathtub. Now, it's legal in California, finally do gray water from the laundry. They call it laundry to landscape gray water. And it has a valve so that in the winter time, you turn the valve and all the gray water goes back to the sewer or septic tank. In the summer, you turn the valve and the gray water goes to a couple of trees. And it allows you to get good growth off the trees. And when they use gray water in a number of studies in South Africa for vegetables, they got a 12% or greater yield out of the vegetables using gray water. So that means in a place like Missouri, where I grew up, a drought is four weeks. But if you had a laundry to landscape, you could ha you could irrigate that plant every day or every week, depending on how, how often you do laundry. Hmm. And the plants will probably grow better than if you used a hose. Why is that? Uh, it's because gray water has a lot of particulates and a lot of nutrition. In other words, in the shower, you're generating cells from your skin, you're generating dirt from the reason you're showering, yeah. <laughs> and the soaps and detergents can act as a phosphate or, or a potassium fertilizer. So basically, uh, gray water is, quote, dirty, but that dirt, the roots see that dirt as fertilizer. And there is actually one soap that was developed by another gray water guru to fertilize plants from laundry water. It's a soap specifically designed to be used in the laundry to have more nutrients than any other soap. That's got to be the direction we're heading. Yeah. So that means that gray water can expand into many different areas because you can switch it back and forth from the laundry 
and take care of droughts that are one, two, three, four, five, six weeks. It doesn't have to be six months. <laughs> yeah, yes. In extreme cases, it does, but not in every case. When I was looking into this, I, I discovered I can even use um, my dog water, right? That, that That's supposed to be great for plants. Yeah, exactly. Anything that's not uh, sewage from the toilet, uh, basically. Uh, you can use uh, kitchen sink water if you have really big pipes that don't have a lot of bends in them so that as they build up, the fats and oils build up on the inside of the pipe. It doesn't clog it. Basically, we keep it simple and don't use that water. Well, I tell you what, you have such a vast knowledge of so many different areas of horticulture. We could talk for hours. But before we wrap this up here, I want to make sure that we highlight a few videos that I'd found on your YouTube channel that I think are so helpful. And the first one is you have this video on how to select a bare root fruit tree. And you say in this video that the first job is to inspect the callus and then look at the root system and then inspect the top. And you're looking for something that's either well-formed or if it isn't, you just cut it off. And you say never to buy mail order bare root fruit trees. So right. <laughs> I have a friend that owns a, a major uh, wholesale or retail mail order company. And he wouldn't like me to say that. But what happens is you don't have any choice. And so I've seen people get stuff in the mail that was either horrible lack of callus or a big bend in the tree where it's supposed to be straight at the callus or pathetic uh, root systems or too many branches, actually, you know, but in the wrong angle of attachment in the wrong position. So I prefer to have people go to their nursery in the bare root season so they can select the best tree. You start with the callus because that's where the variety of an apple is grafted onto a rootstock. But if that callus doesn't form, you have wood that can start rotting right down the middle of the tree into the root system. So a, a good forming callus is critical to the long-term health of the root system. Well, friendship aside, I think it's a fantastic video. And <laughs> I think it really, I mean, you're, it's such a great uh, tutorial. It's about 10 minutes long and you really walk people through. What I loved the absolute best about it is you're standing there in a nursery. I don't know who's doing the filming for you, but you're you're just literally like, here's a tree. Let's look at this one. Okay, here's a tree. Let's look at this one. I wouldn't pick this one. I would pick this one. And you just walk people through it. So I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I mean, not everybody gets to go to the nursery with Robert Corrick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to do one with container plants. You still, if it's a variety that's grafted, there are like, uh, there are varieties of trees like ginkgos that are selected for being narrower growth, so closer to columnar. So they're, they're named the varieties, cultivars of ginkgos. And the way they have to do that is they have to graft it onto a ginkgo rootstock. Well, that's where you look for the callus. Again, it doesn't have to be just a fruit tree. All fruit trees have calluses, except for figs. Uh, out here, we get figs by rooting them straight on their own stick. Uh, but everything else is grafted. Uh, but there are many uh, horticultural ornamental, rather, uh, trees, shade trees and such, where if you have a cultivar, you, you need to look for that graft. But then you pull the plant from the container and see how massive the root system is as far as being too overgrown or too circling in the pot. And you might choose to get a plant that's less circling so it's easier to plant. If they are circling, can you just snip it off? Yeah, there's a couple of ways of tearing them apart, spreading them out, cutting off the very bottom and spreading the bottom out. But Linda Chalker Scott is one of the best people for dismantling myths about gardening. She works for the Washington Master Gardener Program. She has done experiments where they took about 15 gallon sized trees and they tore them apart for half of them and then they shaved them the other half by taking a knife and cutting off the outer one to three inches of the root system and planting them. And then they pulled them two years later and they found that the root system of the trees that were shaved was superior to the root system of those that were torn apart. 
Wow. So we're learning new things every day. Yeah, that's astounding. You know, the other video that you have that I want to make sure people are aware of is you have a brief video that I think of as your Root Basics 101 video. And what I thought was absolutely hilarious is you have this demo shrub root that uh, you actually have an eye hook attached to at the top and you keep it handy in your house so that when you're trying to educate people about the way roots grow, the way they like to grow, you've got this uh, demo root system. I'm curious where you actually hang this thing if you're hanging it in your house. (laughs) (laughs) In the forest next to my house, I had six or eight hanging from the tree so people would see lots of different roots. Oh, wow. Is that where you hang them? It's from a tree? No, the one in the in the YouTube, there's one large room that's a kitchen and sitting area, and I, I have it hanging from the ceiling near the sitting area. So like you said earlier, uh, before we got on the air, it's like a ch- chandelier. <laughs> <laughs> but I use the reason it's on a hook is I use it in demos uh, at garden clubs and master gardeners, but I also take it every September to the National Heirloom Expo. So I can show people that it has no taproot and try to get people to come over to the booth and see my book. Yeah. I mean, the takeaway that 98% of the trees out there don't have taproots, that's a totally revolutionary concept for most people, isn't it? Exactly. I'm hoping that seeing that root stock from a distance with no taproot will get people thinking. Well, and it's got to spur questions. Probably just hold this thing up and people just immediately start to think about the way these things are growing. Yeah, exactly. Now, it's not that wide because I can only dig up a certain amount (laughs) of the system and carry it around. (laughs) But the part where it's broken off or dug up is an inch, inch and a half in diameter. So it shows that it could be going many, many, many feet sideways because of the diameter where it's at all. Yeah, it's pretty hefty. Well, I'm now I'm laughing. I'm imagining you in the center of this massive root ball or this massive, you know, octopus like root thing going, okay, Robert's in there somewhere, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or the worms in the kids' book. There you go. That's right. Well, let's close the show out by having you share uh, some of the ways that people can get a hold of you. Tell us about your website, where you're at on social media, how to get a hold of you. Okay, my website is my name. Robert Corrick, K-O-U-R-I-K, on the internet, it's all one word, dot com. So it's not Katie Corrick, it's, she spelled it wrong, it's K-O-U-R-I-K. And how about social media? Uh, I do have a, what I call business page on Facebook. It's Robert Corrick, with a space between Robert and Corrick, slash sustainable edible landscapes. Because my first book in 86 uh, is still in print as a very good Bible on how to do edible landscaping. Oh, you know, and that that brings me to uh, something else we want to mention, which is how people can get your books. Because apparently they're actually cheaper to get from your website than they are from Amazon. Yeah, if you take the cost of a book in Amazon and add their shipping fee to it, my books are cheaper because I don't charge shipping or tax to California people. So the books are cheaper, but I also norm I offer them for twenty bucks each instead of twenty five. Uh, but I have a special deal going on right now where you can get both Roots Demystified and Understanding Roots for thirty dollars, only fifteen bucks each. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm I'm trying to get the full set so you can have what I call the prequel and the sequel all at the same time. Yep, the definitive volume on Roots. There are there just are not that many books on Roots. Yeah, I'm the only two. For home gardeners, the three German books I use and the Hungarian book and a few other books, if you bought them, it would be close to $600 worth of books. So people are getting a really good deal because I've condensed down those books into some of the best drawings from the books. And, you know, it really dovetails very nicely with your expertise in, in drip irrigation. Yeah, it's a perfect combination. So in lectures... Uh, I always include a section on drip at the root lecture. My passion is to try to have a maintenance-free garden from a water standpoint. So I I put in uh, here with our sprinkler system, I'll put in a manifold, which is like this 
octopus thing that turns right. your sprinkler head into, you know, you have all these ports. And, right, um, right. yeah. And of course, the guys from the irrigation uh, companies, you know, they don't really want to do that kind of stuff. They want to put in in ground sprinkler systems and then walk away. Um, right. but, but I was really passionate about trying to get, you know, drip into my beds, but then also my hanging plants, any container that I have, because I grow in a lot in containers. And mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. um, I, I love fountains. I have this thing for fountains. So I'll scour Craigslist and try to find fountains that way because I love to rehab them. And so I'll do a lot of rehab work on these fountains that I find on Craigslist because most people end up giving them up after they can't keep them working and then their pumps burn right. out. But if they knew how to keep the water level sufficient with drip, they would never let them go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll bring yeah. uh, drip tubing in there. But what I've learned is that when I bring drip tubing into a fountain, that, that tubing needs to stay above water level. Um, oh, that's interesting. Because if it goes below water level, when the sprinkler system goes off, it will fill the reservoir. But then when it shuts off, there's suction in that line. Oh, and a, yeah, oh. so after like you, you walk by, it's filling, you're thinking, oh, this is fantastic. My fountain is full. Well, then you come back two minutes later and all the water is gone. You're like, my God, what just happened here? Well, it's the mm -hmm, suction mm -hmm. in the line and it literally sucked it all back. So what I started learning is that Let's say I have an urn fountain. Well, then when I put the drip tubing up through there, I will have it kind of just hanging out way up high in the top of the of the piece that's inside. Or if I'm filling, let's say I'm filling a whiskey barrel with water, I'll just have it zip tied to the power line for the pump and I won't let it get submerged in the water. I'll just have it kind of on the edge there attached to the power line so that it doesn't go below the water level. Yeah. Yeah, great. That's a good thing to know. Yeah. I was thinking to add it to my bird bath. Oh, yeah, and I do that too. So what I'll do there is I'll always kind of position my bird bath by like trees. And what I'll do is I'll attach the drip line so it goes up into this tree, this branch that's just kind of hovering over, and then I'll zip tie it and just have it so that it's it's just like, um, like an airdrop. It's just perfectly aligned over the top of the bird bath. And then they're great. getting fresh water. It really works out great. But I love doing that. I w I love listening to Mike McGrath on uh, his show. And he was saying that birds uh, this time of year actually need more water than they do bird seed. And so I thought, well, then, heck, I'm done with bird seed. I'm so tired of having, you know, any type of pest or vermin because they like it, too. And I thought, yeah, we get rats. Oh, yeah. my gosh. So I thought, nope, I'm done with that. But I will have lots of, you know, fountains running and bird baths. And I do the same thing where I just run like for a minute or two minutes in my zones but it's enough to kind of flush out uh, the water, and the birds just absolutely love it. So it's fantastic. Yeah, we have uh, bird baths that they love. But, yeah, my drip system for our containers comes on for five minutes every day, so that would do it. It would. It would completely do it. Yep, and you'd have your, your bird bath ready to go. Yeah, good. That's fantastic. I forgot to mention on my website, I have three e-books I developed. But you can also buy both root books as an ebook, a PDF, and save five to seven dollars compared to buying this paper. Oh, that's so I, great! I'm getting more and more people buying the ebook in America as well as, of course, foreign countries. Like I sold one to somebody in Estonia. And I sold a uh, roots book to somebody in Ukraine. Uh, and a lot of book sales in Australia. Wow. Now, here's another question with that is audiobooks. Do you have audiobooks? No, I don't. Because this, my books are so dependent upon the visuals. In other words, it'd be impossible to describe a root system in detail to make it look as beautiful as a drawing. And like I did a book on drip irrigation, <laughs> I said, well, and you turn left right here on the pipe and you find Take a male, a. <laughs> or, right, a male thread that you insert carefully into the female thread. But it would be the dirtiest book on uh, <laughs> yeah. Plumbing. You'd get an explicit rating and you're like, I'm just talking about drip irrigation, guys. <laughs> right. Not safe for work. <laughs> That's right. Well, what are your three ebooks on, Robert? The one is uh, on no till, explains the soil ecology of why no till works. It's not a step by step, but it gives you the 17 pages of how it works. Then there's one on the garden myth that is over 100 pages of different garden myths. 
And then, like uh, ladybugs, mostly when you buy ladybugs, they fly away because they were gathered from the wild in these, what they call a convergence in the foothills of uh, California. And they're loaded up with fat because they're spending the winter there. So when they leave, they bring into the garden, they're not hungry. So they take off. Um, and then the other book is on the science and biology and ecology of how is it that you can use drip irrigation, save water, and get much greater yields than any other type of irrigation. One example, an extreme example, is a woman in India was growing chilies. She used about 38% less water, but her yields were 48% higher than the irrigation she used before she used drip. Because of less evaporation, or it's just overall well, more effective? Well, uh, the better use of water, but also... The aerobic soil stays more aerobic. When you flood the soil with the uh, oscillating sprinkler or other sprinklers, the pore space is drowned up, and so you can't get that exchange of gases. So between irrigations, it might dry out too much. During irrigation, it might flood the pore space too much. So the drip irrigation is a way to, to moderate those two extremes and uh, the plants are happier. So the subtitle of the book is a Drip Irrigation for Every Landscape in All Climates. Is anywhere you have a drought of one to five to six weeks, using drip will maintain ideal soil moisture throughout the year and your yields will be higher. In most cases, then I'm assuming what you would rather see is that the soil is moist and that is happening from frequent but less longer periods of irrigating. So you're you're doing right. short bursts. Yeah, you know, I don't say water or wet, I say moist. And when I mean moist, it's so minimal that you can hardly see the change in the color of the soil. And if you pick up a glob of soil, it'll crumble. But it, it's still moist compared to letting it get bone dry between the irrigation. Well, there are definitely a ton of different resources on your website, and you must have no issue writing about virtually any topic in gardening. Yeah, I'm pretty wide range, and I base everything on my experience. In other words, I started using inline drip irrigation tubing in 1982, and I wrote the first book on drip in 93, promoting inline emitter tubing, and it was completely unknown. And now my revised edition came out seven years ago, and we're just now seeing commercial landscapers using inline emitter tubing uh, to make it more efficient to install uh, drip irrigation and to water the entire root system. Well, and I think I mentioned to you that I need to go through my garden now and realign some of where I have my drip irrigation because... It's too close to the base of the of the plants, and it needs to be out a little further for where they prefer to be taking in the water. Yeah, when you plant, you might put the emitter right at the edge of where the uh, new soil meets the uh, dug soil. And then as the plants get older, moving out further encourages the root system to get wider. Yep. Okay, that's great. And do you have any local events that you're doing? Well, I do have a local one coming up soon with uh, Seed Bank. It's an outlet for Baker Creek Seeds. Um, And then I've done Master Gardeners. I have a gardening club coming up in two weeks. And then every September, I'm at the National Heirloom Expo in Santa Rosa at the fairgrounds. And it literally is bringing people in from the whole country. It's, It's three days, everything you can imagine about horticulture, especially anti-GMO and pro-heritage uh, seeds and plants. And I've met like somebody from Australia. They were here for a business trip, and they made sure the business trip overlapped the Heirloom Expo, and they came out and said, I have every one of your books. Wow. <laughs> I was pretty happy. <laughs> That's a fantastic compliment. Yeah, yeah. And I forgot to ask you, are you really six feet tall? I... <laughs> 
Everybody asks, and yes, I really am. And I'm right on the nose. And wow. I was pick, yeah, when I was picking my website name, I thought, what's something about me that, you know, people always say after they meet me and they'll say, oh, she's really tall. Or, you know, if I haven't <laughs> met somebody, I'll say, oh, you'll know when you see me because I'm tall. So I really am the six foot mama. And it was so funny. I was interviewing uh, Sarah Bubakar of Peaceful Valley Grow Organic uh, Seed Company. Right, right. And I get all the way through this interview with her. And at the very tail end, she goes, I have a confession. And I said, what? And she goes, I'm six one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm only five, six, so I'm shorter. And then I have no hair. <laughs> oh and you have plenty of hair. <laughs> oh, I, I still have hair. But now I tell you what, I've got, you know, four kids and I've got these three boys that are all going to be really tall. In fact, one of our sons is going to be, I think we're thinking almost seven feet tall. So I'm, I'm wow. for the first time in my life, I'm starting to feel short, and I'm definitely feeling a little poorer too, trying to feed all these people. So, right, exactly. <laughs> the, the garden's becoming well, you, more and more. You important. need to write a kid's book on roots, and then make a lot of money. Yeah, there you go. That's right. <laughs> Well, they they have fun with us. And, you know, at the end of every show, they have to do research on whatever topic the show is about. And then oh, and then I interview them. So at the tail end of the show, the Easter egg, the little the little secret thing will be right at the very end. And then they'll come in and I'll interview them and they have to tell me what they what they've learned about roots or things that they have found about roots. So I force them to read poetry about, you know, gardens or roots or what have you. And so they learn right along with me. But it's good for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always tell the kids, I can teach you or God can teach you. Either way, you'll learn. <laughs> well, Robert, this was a complete pleasure. What a joy. Great part of my day. Thanks. I really enjoyed it. It was wonderful. And you, like I said in the email, you did better prep than anybody I've ever had an interview with. Well, I so appreciate that, nice. that. Well, I didn't want to. And then I thought, oh, my gosh, I, did I scare this guy? <laughs> I didn't want to scare <laughs> So like you were like, well, there were a lot of questions. (laughs) There were a lot of questions, but I was just, oh my gosh, I've got this subject matter expert and I get them all to myself. It's like a private conference. It was fantastic. (laughs) I think it's a must read for people. If I, if I encounter people, I'll be steering them your way for sure. So this is really great. You've been super generous with your time. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, that's it for our show today. I want to thank Robert Corrick for being my guest. He was absolutely fantastic. And if you want to thank Robert, Robert, go to his website and buy his books, Understanding Roots and Roots Demystified. Remember, you can get them cheaper at his website than you can on Amazon. And just a reminder that you can find the Still Growing Podcast on iTunes, as well as on my favorite app for listening to podcasts, Stitcher Radio. And I'll have all the information from the show today on my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. My website is not only the home for the Still Growing Podcast, but also provides information and inspiration for your home and garden. And if you want to connect, you can find me on facebook.com backslash still growing with six foot mama, or feel free to email me with questions or comments at jennifer at six Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is an hour long weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. All right, so the kids are here, and they're going to be doing a review of the life and work of John Ernest Weaver, because he is the man that inspired Robert Corrick to write his books on understanding roots and roots demystified. So we're going to start off today with PJ. Hi, everybody. And PJ, you're how old? I'm 12 years old. Awesome. And what is your favorite class? Uh, Studies, because I really like my teachers, Miss Single. Yes. And for people who don't know what studies are, what is studies? It's basically history, but we call it MN studies. Minnesota studies. Yeah. And why do you like Miss Ingle so much? Because um, she's a really good teacher and she's more understanding and like I can understand her more than the other teachers and kind of gives you more like if we had we had a test, she gives you like a review, like a review section where we can like study before the test so we can get our brains ready for it so yeah all right so you really like miss engel and you really like history
Yeah. So you did some research on the life of John Ernest Weaver. Oh, yes, I did. Now, PJ. Yes, I did. John Ernest Weaver was born in Iowa on May 5th, 1884. His father, John Weaver Sr., a farmer and Civil War veteran, was born in Germany. Amelia Weaver, his mother, was born in Lee County, Iowa. In 1909, John graduated from the University of Nebraska and then received his doctor's degree from the University of Minnesota. Go Gophers! Professor Weaver was married to Martha Helen Hasey. Two children were born into this union. Cornelia Marcia, born February 6, 1909, and Robert John, born September 20, 1917. In 1915, Dr. Weaver joined the faculty of the University of Nebraska at Lincoln and began a career which was to last over 35 years. His career made the University of Nebraska a leader in plant ecology for over 20 years. Starting in the summer of 1917, Weaver was studying prairie plant roots. He began digging grave-like pits on prairies around Lincoln, excavating individual plant roots like an ar- archaeologist, studying how root systems knit together and respond to the climate. When Weaver began his root studies, much of the prairie lands had been stirred by man in previous in previous decades, and 1920s brought even greater destruction. This upset Weaver as he viewed the prairie lands as the best way of conserving the soil and its fertility. A former student, Dr. Stoddard, said this about Dr. Weaver. There comes occasionally, to every scientific field, a man who is so enthusiastic and so devoted to his work that it becomes his very way of life. To him, nature seems to unfold her secrets in response to his devotion, his ability to understand and communicate with nature becomes an inspiration to students and fellow workers alike. Such a man is John Ernest Weaver in the field of American grassland ecology. Thank you, everybody. All right, buddy, do you want to send in Emma? Sure. All right, so Emma's here. Hi. And Emma, you're 14. Yep. And you are going to be telling us a little bit about Nine Mile Prairie. That's right. So I understand you have four key facts about this important historic place. Correct. All right, take it away, Emma. I'm ready. Nine Mile Prairie was added to the United States National Register of Historic Places in 1986. Nine Mile Prairie consists of 228 acres of native prairie and is located northwest of Lincoln, the state capital of Nebraska. The prairie was so named in the 1930s because of its location, exactly nine miles from the Lincoln City Square. All right, Emma, what's fact number two? Fact number two is... Nine Mile Prairie is significant in the areas of science and education for its association with the life of Dr. John Ernest Weaver, a University of Nebraska professor known as the founding father of modern plant ecology. Dr. Weaver became internationally known and respected for his work in the field of plant ecology, authoring or co-authoring a hundred technical papers and a dozen books to become the world's top authority on prairie vegetation. All right, what's fact number three? Fact number three is, as one of the largest tracts of virgin prairie remaining in eastern Nebraska, the Nine Mile Prairie historic site is important because Dr. Weaver performed much of his work on this virgin tract of prairie land, and it is the only site in the state that holds such a long history of continuous scientific study. That's exactly right, Emma. In fact, they've been using that land for research purposes, for almost 100 years now. Wow. What's your final fact? My final fact is, since its establishment, the Nine Mile Prairie has been used for research and study by thousands of college, secondary, and elementary school students. So, Miss Emma, thank you for that information. And since we have family in Omaha and in Lincoln, there's a good chance that we will stop and see the Nine Mile Prairie Historic Site, the next time we're in Nebraska. I'm so excited. I can barely (laughs) wait. (laughs) 
That's terrific. As long as we can see the zoo, please. Oh Are you zebras? okay? <laughs> Just uh, <laughs> thanks for your help, Emma. Good night, Mom. Good night. I think I nailed that. Uh, hello. Do I, why am I not? I don't sound good. Do I? I don't have earphones on. Oh, now I sound good. Hello. Oh, I sound great. All right. So Will is here. Hi, everyone. How are y'all doing? All right. And you are going to actually be reading a, uh, let's see, what is it called? And you are going to be reading excerpts from a speech that was given at the Nine Mile Prairie 25th anniversary celebration, which took place on October 16th, 2009. And the speech was important or is important because much of it featured Dr. John Weaver. And Dr. John Weaver is who inspired Robert Corrick to write his book, Understanding Roots and Roots Demystified. So he was an inspirational figure to the author that I interviewed for my show today. All right, yeah. And you're going to read some of the key excerpts from that speech. Cool. All right, so we'll take it away. Okay, so to many of us, the Nine Mile Prairie symbolizes the birthplace of prairie ecology, and it celebrates scientist John Weaver as the father of prairie ecology. It was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1986. Looking east towards the capital in downtown Lincoln and west to the 230-acre Native Prairie, I feel a connection to three big names in the history of science at the University of Nebraska. Charles Bessie, John Weaver, and Frederick Clements. John Weaver came to Nebraska as an undergraduate to study under the famous botanist Charles Bessie. Bessie was installed in the Nebraska Hall of Fame in June 2009, and his bust is now in the Capitol. John Weaver went to the University of Minnesota, where he finished his Ph.D. under Frederick Clements in 1916. Of these three biologists, Bessie, Weaver, and Clements, Clements is probably the most famous. Clements was a Lincoln, Nebraska kid who went to the University of Nebraska in the 1890s, got caught under Bessie's spell, and eventually laid out a theory and framework that dominated the field of ecology throughout the 20th century. In fact, every ecology textbook written in the last 50 years spends at least a page on Frederick Clements and his theory of succession. John Weaver is known for three things. One, his detailed study of roots. Two, his work in grassland and rangeland ecology. And three, the way that he promoted and defended Clements' ecological theories until his death in 1966. One standard that scientists use to measure their impact is the Science Citation Index, a computerized database of the entire scientific literature since 1990. Weaver is still one of the most cited Nebraska University scientists in the current scientific literature, half a century after his retirement. His papers and books have been cited over 2,300 times by other scientists since 1990. That count only includes works on which he was the lead author, not his papers co-authored with 40-plus graduate students. Few scientists leave that kind of legacy and ongoing impact in their discipline. The money to buy Nine Mile Prairie was donated by Mrs. Margaret Hall in honor of her late husband, Neil Hall. There's a wonderful picture of Mrs. Hall in the front of the podium today that was taken when she was here at the Nine Mile Prairie for the dedication ceremony 25 years ago. She has since passed away. A family member told me one regret Mrs. Hall had uh, uh, cringe a family member told me that one regret Mrs. Ball a family member told me the one regret Mrs. Hall had was that she never got to see a controlled prairie oh my goodness a family member told me the one regret Mrs. Hall had was that she never got to see a controlled prairie fire burn my only thought is that when we do burns today the plume of smoke goes very high Perhaps Mrs. Hall can see it from where she is now. All right, Will, thanks for reading that excerpt. That was excellent. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so John is here. Hi. So you're going to help us with the top 10 things we learned from Understanding Roots by Robert Corrick. Okay. Top 10 things we learned from Understanding Roots by Robert Corrick. Okay, John, what's number 10? Some vegetable roots grow deeper than some tree roots. Number nine. Roots will grow away from infertile or tainted soil, even if it means turning around and growing back upward. They really want to be in a nice environment, don't they, John? Yep. And bad soil makes roots very unhappy. Definitely. 
What's number eight? A plant's root mass often grows up to three times wider than its foliage canopy. What does that mean, John? That means that the plant's roots go way beyond the furthest branch of the tree. That's right. How about number seven? Virtually, no plant reveals what the root looks like just by looking at the foliage. For example, horseradishes grow up to two to three feet tall, but the roots have been mapped down to 13 feet deep. That's more than twice of your height, Mom. That's right, John. What's number six? Most trees in many soils and climates have roots many times wider than their depth. The roots are going much wider than they are deeper, right? Yes. That's a huge point in this book, isn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. It's something most people don't understand. It really is a new way to understand roots. All right, John, what's number five? Number five, very few trees have tap roots. Just 2% actually have tap roots. The exceptions are oaks when they are young, pine trees, and most nut trees. Otherwise, 98% of trees do not have tap roots. That's another crazy thing most gardeners would be surprised to hear about. Indeed. What's number four? Number four, most trees have 50 to 80% of their roots in the top 18 to 24 inches of soil. That's right, John. And we also discovered that the top two inches of soil are the most aerobic, meaning that the top two inches of the soil are the absolute best soil on the planet. Cool. What's number three? Number three, don't put a drip line at the base of a tree. Place it all over the outer root system. Starting about four feet out, lay it down like rows of sheet music. What's number two? Number two, water and nutrients are not absorbed at the trunk of a tree. That's right, John. That's because it's almost physically impossible for the roots at the base of a tree to take in water and nutrients because the roots near the trunk have bark on them. And bark means that there are no root hairs growing there. And root hairs do all the work in terms of absorbing water and nutrients. And the majority of those are found further out from the tree, not near the trunk. All right, John, what's number one? Number one, tree roots extend outward and they absorb 90% of all their water and nutrients from roots four feet out and beyond. Now that you understand roots, you can take better care of your plants. That's exactly right. Good night. <laughs>